Hello, hello. This is a video about one of the two beam stresses. So we know that there are two types of beam stresses. We have flexural stresses. We use a sigma because they are normal to the plane of the cross section. And we have transverse shear stresses. We use tau because they are in plane or parallel to the plane of the cross section. This particular problem is all about shear stresses. So we're thinking of the, equa the equation shear stress tau is equal to VQ over IT. Sometimes you see this one as VQ over IB means the same thing. We see here a picture of our cross section itself. We have an I shaped, kind of an oddly shaped cross section, but that's okay. <laughs> We have an oddly shaped, um, I-shaped cross section, and there's our internal shear force that is transferred in this cross sectional plane. So first thing we notice is, okay, our shear force is in the plane of the cross section. Second thing we want to do is figure out the axis of bending, and it is always the one that is perpendicular or transverse to the direction of the internal shear force. So there's our axis of bending. It's also called our neutral axis or neutral surface. Over to the right, we would like to do a plot of the shear stress distribution that tells me how shear stresses vary from the top fiber, like all these fibers up here, how much shear stress are they feeling? What's happening here? You know, what are these shear stresses feeling? And, you know, when we neck down to this very small amount of cross section, you know, what's happening there? We're going to get a jump or a discontinuity, work our way all the way down the cross section um, to get all those values. As we think about this equation, let's see what we know and what we need to figure out. So my shear force, I'm just going to plug this one in. It's given to us in this problem. Oftentimes you need to do the shear diagram to figure out what this is, but I'm going to preemptively turn this into newtons. So I'm going to say my shear force is equal to 36 E3 newtons or 36,000 newtons, um, which is the same as 36 kilonewtons. And my moment of inertia, let's get that one sorted out. So I want my centroidal moment of inertia about the axis of bending. And I know I've got to use my parallel axis theorem for the moment of inertia about this axis. And that breaks down something like this. The summation of the moments of inertia um, for each component about its own centroidal axis plus the summation of the areas of the components times a distance term squared. And here's how we are going to break that up. I'm going to actually add a new layer so that I can delete it a little bit um, in just a little bit. Okay, so I am going to make a choice right now. So in order to use the parallel axis theorem, I can either do solids or voids. And if I wanted to do solids, here's what I would probably do. Not the right tool. That's what I need, a rectangle. All right, so I would use this area. And then I would use this area. And then I would do this area right there and use an additive method. Um, but if I did that, I would not be working very efficiently because I would have to compute these distance terms from the center of the component down to that axis of bending and square them. So I'm going to get some distance terms here. So I'm going to try to work smarter, not harder, and I'll approach it this way. So I'm going to take this solid right here, take that solid, and I'm going to subtract these two voids. So I want to subtract that shape and this shape. Okay, and the reason why I'm doing that is because all three of those shapes have a centroid, just like the centroid of that big rectangle, the solid piece, and the centroid of these smaller 
rectangles, the purple ones, these are the voids, all of those centroids lie on the axis of bending. So that means I've got no distance squared terms if I use solids and voids. So I'm going to use that technique. So my moment of inertia of the big yellow, um, of the big yellow rectangle, this one right here. So I've got a base of 45 plus 45 plus 10, that's 100. And I've got a height of well, the summation of all this. So 80 plus 20 plus 20, that's 120. That's the one I want to cube because it's perpendicular to the axis of bending, OK? And I'm going to need that 1 12th expression in here. But because I know it's coming, I'll pull it outside the parentheses, OK? So that first term is bh cubed over 12 for the large rectangle. Let's remove that yellow rectangle. Look at the purples. These are voids, so I'm going to use a minus sign. For a base, I can use the summation of 45 plus 45, so I'll sum that up to 90, and then the height is 80. That's the one that I cube. That's bh cubed over 12, and that one is good to go. Okay, so we don't have any areas in distance terms when we use voids. And of course, that's not a universal rule, just something that happens to be true for this cross section. I'll let you multiply this one out on your own into four sig figs. You'll get 10.56 E6 millimeters to the fourth. That's what we're going to want to plug in for my moment of inertia, my moment of inertia in our shear stress equation. So lots of different steps in these types of problems, but many of these steps, for example, moment of inertia, you know all about. You've done this a million times before. Maybe not a million, but at least a hundred, right? Okay, now we need Q and T, and these are going to depend on position, which I'll call Y. Okay, so what I'm going to use, I'm going to assume that Y is the direction of the shear. Let's see if I can get this a little more centered, close enough, right? So here is my Y centroidal axis going that way. And if I wanted to draw Y in this picture, Y goes up like this, OK? So Y goes up in both pictures. But the picture on the right, imagine cutting this cross-sectional shape out of a piece of cardboard, and then you're rotating it 90 degrees so that this line becomes your piece of cardboard. So in other words, um, in the drawing on the left, this could be your z centroidal axis, OK? And then now we're kind of looking at a side view. So you could think of this view being you know, with respect to x and y. And of course, what we're actually plotting is tau transverse shear stress using this formula. All right, a few things we know from the formula are the top point and the bottom point. These are the quote unquote extreme fibers. Those are the quote unquote extreme fibers and those get a shear stress of zero as shown. Now I am going to save myself a little time and energy since my cross section is symmetric, my shear stress distribution is going to also be symmetric. All right, so what I want to do is try to sketch in, um, let me do one other thing. Yeah, let's lock that one down so I can't accidentally move it. All right, so we've got a nice parabola. Okay, remember from the what we worked in class that when you have a rectangular cross section or a cross section comprised of component rectangles, your shear stress distribution will look like a parabola. And once I get to once I get to this junction, 
between what we call the flange of the beam. The flange is that top wide part and then the web that's the part in the middle, right? We're going to get a discontinuity. Now let's pretend my drawing is a little better than it is. We're going to get a discontinuity. And what that discontinuity is there for is that my thickness is changing, right? So here's my cross-sectional width or thickness up at the top. So I would plug in that value of 100 millimeters wide um, for all of these points. And then right as I got below that fiber, now I'm just plugging in a small value of just 10 millimeters. So that's why we're going to get that jump. Jumping back to my diagram at right, there's another parabola in play. Well, good enough. <laughs> Not the prettiest thing I've ever drawn, but that's okay. Let me keep my symmetry on and just kind of clean this up, right? So what we're, what we're looking at are two different parabolas. We're looking at two different parabolas. We have a big parabola, we have a small parabola, and the part that we're really interested in is inside that function. So I can add one more line. Let's see if I can make this work. Fingers crossed. Thanks for watching my videos. Sorry that these aren't super scripted, but more organic. There, isn't that beautiful? All right, so that is a picture of our shear stress distribution as it varies from top to bottom. And what it tells us is that the top fiber, my shear stress is equal to zero. I'm going to need to figure out what my shear stress is here. I'm going to need to figure out what my shear stress is here. And then my maximum shear stress, that's the one that lives right there, right at the axis of bending. And that's going to be my worst case shear stress. I want to figure that one out as well. So basically, I've got three calculations to do to make this happen. Let us work from top to bottom. All right, so I'm going to call this shear stress tau 1. I'll call this one tau 2 and this one tau 3. Let's figure out what tau 1 is. We use our equation. Shear stress equals VQ over IT. Now the V is going to be constant throughout. So 36 E3 Newtons, we've got that one ready to go. And in the denominator, our moment of inertia is going to be the same for all three calcs. So I'll put that down below. My thickness or width of the cross section. So I want to use this fiber right here, right above the discontinuity. And then I'll get one just below the discontinuity to calculate that much larger stress, tau 2. So the big width, there's that T in the denominator. I'll plug in uh, 45 plus 45 plus 10 is equal to 100 millimeters. All right, now for the part of the calculation that when you are learning this, this is most probable, this is most probably, if you make an error, where your error will lie. So here's what we want to do. I'm going to take a little line right there. It's going to slice my cross section through my point of interest. Okay. I slice my cross section right there. So I want to get what's happening right at that junction. Pick the area either above or below. I'll pick the area above. Why? Because it's easier. I've only got one rectangle. I'll take that deal all day long. Okay. Next up, figure out where the centroid of that rectangle is right there. That is the distance that we want from the centroid of the piece or component back to the neutral axis. And so we want that Q. So the Q is that area times distance term. Um, our area is, we've got uh, 20 by 100. And then our distance, so we're going to measure from here up to here, that's 40. And then I want 10 more, so that sums up to 50. And my units, of course, are millimeters Q. 
cubed. Okay. I will multiply all of that out, or rather I will use my notes in which I have it written down. And once you perform that calculation, you will get a stress of 3.41 megapascals. Megapascals is in the legend, so it's kind of redundant to relabel, but it doesn't add confusion, so I'm okay with that. I'm assuming you spot checked all your units. So we have Newtons up here. We've got all kinds of millimeters, right? So millimeters to the fifth in the denominator, millimeters cubed in the numerator. That nets me millimeters squared in the denominator. All that together, that is a megapascal. So my units are looking good. Okay, so I've got tau one taken care of. Let's see what I can do. I'm going to turn that layer off. I'm going to keep that one and add a new one. And on the new one, oh, actually, I don't even need to do that. Give me a second. Okay, so I'm going to keep this one. Yeah, I need to just do one thing. All right, so in order to change this from tau one to tau two, Let's erase that. Let's turn this into tau two. What is the shear stress here on the stress distribution? And in real life, like that correlates to those fibers just below the flange, the very top of the web. Um, so we've got a flange up here. We have a web here. We have a flange down here. Those are the fancy terms for part of an I-shaped cross-section. Okay, so all we have to do is my shear force the same? Yes. Is my Q calculation the same? Yes. Is my moment of inertia the same? Yes. The only thing that changes is the width. So let's get that 100 out of there and swap it out with 10. You can do that pretty easily just by removing a zero there. And um, so yeah, we just we're going to divide by 10 instead of dividing by 100 and that's going to get us a much larger stress in fact it's just going to go up by a factor of 10 so i'll add that in okay so instead of 3.41 this one goes up to 34.1 megapascals all right, let's continue. We've only got one more value to solve, um, and that's going to be there in the middle. So I think what I'm going to do here, I'm going to keep everything that I've done before. And one little maneuver I want to make. I'm just going to give myself a little bit more room. So I'm going to pull this down. I'm not going to need this. Well, actually, I can still use this. All right, I'll use this. Uh, put it there. But there will be more to that calculation. So let's keep working with it. And I'll show you what I mean about all this. OK. Thanks for hanging with me through all of my layers and colors. OK. In this part of the problem, we want to figure out what is tau three? That happens to be max. What is the maximum shear stress? So I'll change my subscript down here from a two to a three. My V term is the same. That hasn't changed. Keep it. There's my moment of inertia. Keep it. Same thing. Um, what is my thickness or width right here for these fibers to get this value? Well, it's just 10 millimeters, so I can keep this value. The one thing I need to do is add another term to my Q calculation, and this is what that term is. I'll use a purple, and I'll use uh, purple, fine. I'll use a purple color for this one. So in addition to that blue area, now I also need this piece right there, right? I need that purple piece to enter my formulation. Okay, so again, now I need the center of that new area, and I have another distance 
term right there. If I was watching my subscripts carefully, I would do something like this. The big shape, I would call area one. And so I would write out something like Q equals A1 D1, there's D1, and then add in plus A2 D2. So there is D2 there, there is shape number two. Now, just like any other cross-sectional property, when you're doing a Q calculation, you can use solids or voids. The choice is yours. For this one, it seems simpler and more straightforward to just use solids. The net result of all this is I just need another piece. So I've already got A1, D1 done. Let's add in A2, D2. My little purple rectangle has a base of 10. It has a height of half of 80. That is 40. My distance D2 between the center of the component and the axis of bending is half of 40 or 20 right there. Okay. Finish that up with the correct units. So those two terms are both areas times distances. That lands you to millimeters cubed. Spot check your units again. I know we've done this before, but it's just so good for you to always do this proactively. So you got Newtons. That's not what I wanted to do. Give me one second. Boop. All right, cross your fingers. Okay, so we have Newtons down here. Millimeters to the fourth, there's millimeters to the fifth, there's millimeters cubed. All of that turns into a Newton per millimeter squared. And we know that as our friend the megapascal. Crunch that number through your calculator and you will get our last value, tau 3, is equal to 36.8 megapascals. If you wanted to go crazy with the labeling, you could also label a tau 2 down there. You could label a tau 1 here. And if you wanted to be super clear and kind of unnecessarily redundant, you could label that one as a tau is equal to 0. All right, so to recap, this is a problem about taking a shear force, V equals 36 kilonewtons, turning it into a distribution of shear stress on that plane. The pattern is that the maximum transverse shear stress for all reasonably shaped cross section occurs at the axis of bending. It reduces parabolically as you move away from the axis of bending. There are discontinuities when you go through jumps and then another parabola to get back to zero. I will mention just, you know, because I want this to be accurate, the model we are using in this introductory class to teach shear stress. Is it 100% accurate if I were to put this into a finite element model? No. Okay, we would actually see some variation with respect to the width. Okay, we would see some variation with respect to the width, and we would also not see that abrupt of a discontinuity in that type of plot there. However, our approximation is definitely close enough to our purposes in this class. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.